Chapter 6, A Riotous Time So, at last I'd got there. After seven schools in so many years, I'd finally decided to give it a go and stick at it for a while. I was hearing those voices that you hear in your late twenties. Who are you? Where's it all going? What does it all add up to? Aren't you getting too old to be drifting around? It's time to make something of your life. Buy a flat. All right, I reply to the voices. I have to buy a flat. Then I'll need a mortgage. That means staying in the same job for a while. That means commitment. I had been a proper teacher at Camden School, but now I was going to be a real teacher. It had been easy being a proper teacher at a grammar school. The children were destined for university, however you taught them. At Dalston Mount School, where I was to be second in charge of a large history department, I would have to be a real teacher. If anyone got to university from there, it would be regarded as a minor miracle. That was the challenge ahead of me. It was a noble aim. However, I was to discover very soon that the main priority of everybody in this school was survival. One aspect of my job was to perform the role of tutor to a class of 11-year-olds. These were my kids. I was to be responsible for their welfare and behaviour for the next five years. It all started well enough. There were registrations, during which a little advice was given and some disciplinary measures were taken. I kept in touch with the parents, chased up absentees and sorted out the day-to-day -day problems that my tutor group encountered. Then one day, the earnest and enthusiastic head of year decided to take 180 11-year-olds, including my class, to Butlin's holiday camp in Barry Island, Wales. As a tutor, I was obliged to accompany my group and be responsible for them. This, I can say without hesitation, turned out to be one of the worst weeks of my life. It should have put me off having children forever. It should have ended my teaching career for good. It did neither, but I still shudder at the memory. Eleven-year-old Dorster Mount girls were neither big enough to take care of themselves nor small enough to be intimidated into behaving nicely. On the way there, they were sick at the front of the bus and rioted at the back. Those in the middle seats sang their little hearts out. The driver threatened to leave us on the motorway. The girls threatened him back. Then when they saw that he was serious, tried crying and whimpering and being cute and coy all at the same time. He relented, but I noticed that it was a different driver on the return journey. On arrival, we were shown to our quarters. Wooden huts with no heating, surrounded by barbed wire on a cliff top over the sea, from which was blowing a gale laced with icicles. It was early April. That night, I and the other seven Judas were up till twelve o'clock administering blankets and hot water bottles to shivering children. Some of them clustered together and played cards or sang to keep warm till two in the morning. The early birds rose at five. Every night of the week, someone was crying, fighting, screaming, laughing, singing or running amok. No one slept. Imagine St Trinian's on an outing to Colditz by the sea. At the end of the week, eight sour-faced defeated adults and 180 joyful and victorious children climbed aboard the return coach to London. After another puke-ridden journey, I returned home on Sunday evening to the awful realisation that I now had to prepare lessons for the following week. The next morning I arrived at the school only to find that my classroom had been trashed because the kids didn't like their supply teachers. 
The books were all over the place. I wearily put them back in order. I was now faced with a week's marking to catch up on. Why are you doing this? I asked myself. Why am I not doing a job where they have expense accounts and five-star hotels for their outings or conferences, as they call them? Well, I'm not. So I tidied up the classroom and marked the books. Then I remembered giving a piggyback to one asthmatic little girl who couldn't keep up. She grew up to become a star, singing, dancing and acting on the West End stage. Also, there was that moment when two of the girls were captivated by a starfish on the beach. There were others who climbed the cliffs, raced up and down the sand, made castles, paddled in the water, caught shrimps and tried to catch crabs. I realised that most of the girls hadn't been out of Hackney at all before this. I got on with my work. At the subsequent staff meeting, the head of year told us that she'd received reams of thank you letters from grateful parents. It was a thoroughly worthwhile and educational experience, she proclaimed. Shortly afterwards, she took up new challenges in Botswana, where I think she may have found the supervision of 11-year-old girls a little easier. Becoming increasingly aware of the differences between this girls' comprehensive and the grammar school in Camden. Whereas all the parents attended parents' evenings at Camden School, you felt grateful if even a third showed up at Dalston Mount. The two thirds that did not come were always the parents of those who couldn't or wouldn't work. These, of course, were the people I most wanted to see. I also observed that the aim of the Dalston Mount parents was to demonstrate to me that they were prepared to execute a terrible punishment if their offspring had erred in any way. If she give you any trouble, Mr Baldwin, I will soon deal with her. Just let me know. Any complaint from the daughter was summarily dealt with on the spot. Sometimes with a sharp clout, followed up with, just wait till I get you home, from the mother. Gradually, I began to realise that the Problems of the pupils were frequently identical to those of the parents. Absence of one of the parents, low income, low academic expectations, a lack of understanding of the education system. One day I met the father of Josephine, a girl in my tutor group. He was a Jamaican of late middle age who had a problem with alcoholism. Josephine was in a bit of trouble at school and it needed sorting out. At our meeting, it soon became clear to me that the father did not know what questions to ask me. Do what the teacher say, Josephine, was the only advice he could give his daughter. A few weeks later, he died. Josephine was alone and very scared. Her mother had disappeared some years before, Luckily, there was a relative nearby who took her in. In school, she seemed totally lost. She looked very tired and found it difficult keeping up with a normal programme. Yet, she needed school life even more than before. She attached herself to a kindly school secretary and could be seen following her about and clinging to her skirts. Eventually, Josephine found her way back into the mainstream of school life. She took some examinations and moved on. Some years later, I was talking to a friend who was then teaching drama at Kingsway College. He was telling me about one of his star pupils, a young woman from Hackney called Josephine. By the end of the 70s, there was a deep sense of frustration amongst pupils in schools in the inner cities. 
Many of our students had parents who, like Josephine's father, had migrated to London from overseas. They had arrived with high expectations of the English education system. Back in their homelands, they had been told about Oxford and Cambridge, Eton and Harrow. Schools in the Commonwealth had been modelled on such places. They hadn't been told about state secondary moderns, now called comprehensives, through television programmes such as the Foresight Saga and other period dramas, they'd only glimpsed life in England through the eyes of the upper classes. They knew nothing of the life of the masses, nor of the schools that were designed for them. Josephine's father, who had had no education at all beyond kindergarten, just had faith that his little girl would be looked after by her teachers. We tried, but we were almost as lost as Josephine and her father. The prevailing ethos in education was still based on the idea that a university degree was the true goal of all good aspiring pupils. So the girls we cherished the most were the ones who were likely to sit A-level examinations. These were the ones who would become little copies of us. They would make us the teachers feel successful. But although we worked hard at building up the sixth form, the actual rate of success in terms of university entrance was less than 5%. This meant that 95% of our pupils were going to see themselves as failures. Some of them quickly saw the writing on the wall and opted out before bothering with O-levels. My good, well-attended class of 15-year-olds was shot to pieces one year later with pregnancy, truancy and indifference. It might have helped if they'd been allowed to build up a sense of achievement in stages. None of them had sat a public examination ever before. Very few of them could see the point. The private schools and their pupils know in advance that the O-levels are an achievable goal. They make their pupils sit a similar examination when they are 13, before allowing them to enter the school. Our girls, on the other hand, were totally untested. It was as if both sets of children were trying to jump the same four-foot hurdle on sports day. In the private schools, they had already cleared hurdles set at three foot nine inches. Our girls had never even seen a hurdle before. In the private and grammar schools, most of the pupils are very aware of the rewards to be had for passing exams. All around them are the material benefits to be gained from academic success. Pupils in a school in Hackney having no role models were largely ignorant of those rewards. When exam time finally came, it was like the Battle of the Somme. The lambs were led to the slaughter year after year with the same disastrous results. The sense of disillusion and betrayal was palpable. This, together with high unemployment and insensitive policing on the streets, created a volatile mixture. It erupted in the riots of 1981. During the previous two years, we could sense the rising anger in the classroom. Sometimes it was directed at the teachers, but not often. We were, for the most part, sympathetic, liberal-minded people. There were very few old-school authoritarians left at Dalston Mount. Most teachers tried to understand the problems. Some even sided with the kids in their frustration. On the streets, the girls vented their anger against the police. In school, they turned against each other. Fights would constantly break out. It was a brave member of staff who would try and intervene. I remember trying to separate girls on a number of occasions. Kindly souls on the edge of the crowd would warn me, Don't bother, sir, you'll only get hurt. Sometimes when weapons were involved, teachers were seriously wounded. I was lucky to get away with the odd kick and a blow to the jaw. One day, whilst teaching my good history class, there was a knock at the door. I opened it, and there was Jane Tunney. All eighteen stones of her. I want Janet, she said. Sorry, Jane. 
but she'll have to wait outside until the end of the lesson. I want Janet. Now, said Jane, heaving with rage. Jane, I know your mother and she'll be hearing about this. Step away from the door and wait till the bell goes. All right, Mr Baldwin, just because it's you. The door was closed. Janet hid behind a desk. I tried to carry on with the lesson. The atmosphere was electric. I asked the student to go out and get help. None would. It would have been like missing the World Cup final. The bell for the end of class rang. Jane, with about 100 other girls who had arrived to see the fight, burst into the room. Things happened very fast. Janet was as quick as a street cat scratching a bulldog's nose. Then she was gone. Jane slumped onto a chair. Her face was bleeding. She was heaving in an effort to catch her breath. She was suffering an asthma attack. I tried to calm her down and eventually we found her inhaler. I looked around. The classroom had been devastated. Desks had been tipped up. There was paper everywhere and blood on the floor. A few girls remained. Poor Mr Baldwin, one of them said. They don't pay you enough for this, do they? Twenty minutes later, two members of staff came to give me some help. Neither was a senior teacher. <music> Running fights were a common occurrence. A quarrel would break out. Immediately the cry would go up, Fight! Fight! Half the school would then dash to the scene. The centre of the melee would somehow move like an amoeba from building to building. The fighters might part for a moment and would reconnect in another part of the school, dragging the crowd with them. Carleen was a girl in my class with a sense of humour. She spotted in this phenomenon the potential for enormous fun. She got a few of her friends to gather round and form a scrum. Then she yelled, Fight! at the top of her powerful voice. Immediately, a huge crowd collected to watch the scrap. Carleen and her friends moved off to another part of the school and yelled, Fight! once more. The crowd followed them again. This time, the attention of the head and deputy had been attracted. They tagged along at the back, trying to keep up. From my classroom, I watched the whole procession move around the school from block to block like some mad carnival that had lost its way, led solely by Carleen shouting the word, Fight! Then suddenly, the whole thing disappeared, leaving the head and deputy standing alone and bemused. The head had, by now, almost given up on this school. When she'd been appointed, it was to a new comprehensive that was the result of an amalgamation of an old grammar school and a secondary modern. By 1979, the grammar school intake had left and Dalston Mount was, in effect, a secondary modern, once again only much bigger than before. The head did not understand or care for the type of pupil for which she was now responsible. She had begun to look for a way out. However, the school still had a good staff, academic, committed and caring. It wasn't their fault that the system wasn't designed for their students. Some of these teachers achieved remarkable things against the odds, as did their pupils. A group of 15-year-olds passed English O-level a year early, there were stunning dance productions, concerts, plays and art exhibitions took place and once a year we let it all out in the staff panto. Life at Dalston Mount was never dull. In spite of the mad absurdity of it all, there was that sense of communal purpose which sailors must feel in the midst of a storm. Yet there were even nastier clouds looming on the horizon. Mrs Thatcher had won the 1979 election. She and her cabinet knew that all was not right in the world of education. She gave the job of Minister for Education to her chief, 
political adviser Sir Keith Joseph. The appointment was significant in itself. It showed that education was now as important as foreign affairs or the economy, if not more so. In the 50s and 60s, ministers of education were lesser beings. No one remembered them, unless they did something newsworthy, such as taking free school milk away from children, Mrs Thatcher, or something worthy, such as trying to bring equality of opportunity to all pupils, Mrs Williams. Real men wanted to be Chancellor of the Exchequer or Foreign Secretary. However, since the Suez Crisis, Westminster had no longer been able to wield the big stick on the world stage. Now Britain was just a small, if reluctant, part of the EEC. So political games were restricted to the country's own backyard. Health, education, police and transport were where the votes lay, and Mrs Thatcher knew it. Something had to be seen to be done with education. Needless to say, Sir Keith had no real understanding of the nature of the problems with which we in the schools were struggling. His previous encounters with education were in the 1930s, and naturally it was from that period that he drew his inspiration. He proclaimed, therefore, that children needed to be taught about dates and kings and queens, trying to get Children to understand their own environment and background was no longer seen as important. Mixed ability teaching, child-centred learning, awareness of many different cultures were all to be thrown out along with the whole idea of comprehensives themselves. The 1930s were back with a vengeance. No attempt was made to try and work out what we were educating children for. No one analysed why comprehensives were not working properly. No one recognised that children in inner city schools needed an examination system that they could understand. A system which could give them the motivation to succeed and which might lead them to a worthwhile career. Instead, the solution was to tell teachers what to teach and how to teach it. The national curriculum was introduced. With each new education minister, there were more and more directives, each one increasing the workload and demoralising the spirit of teachers. We began to feel like overworked, poorly paid automatons, to be blamed for all the troubles of society. The trendy teacher was the new scapegoat. After all, it was a lot cheaper to blame teachers than to invest in buildings and equipment. Schools were to be closed. Lots of money could be saved. Teaching became a joyless occupation. The fun was to be had a few miles away in the city, where you could be seen in the 1980s as an entrepreneur in the spirit of Drake and Raleigh, making millions to boot. None of those millions appeared to drip down to the schools. The opposite seemed to be happening. In 1980, the first signs of the new order became apparent. The ILEA was ordered to make substantial cuts in their budget. Consequently, the number of secondary schools in Hackney was to be reduced from 16 to 10. This meant that there would be a round of serious amalgamations. Amalgamations. The joining together of two or more schools are painful, especially when they are not necessary. Dolster Mount wasn't a good school, but it wasn't a bad one either. There was a sixth form which shared courses with that at Hackney Down School. The school was always well subscribed. The staff remained totally committed. There remained a problem, as described, of indiscipline. This could have been solved with a firmer hand, or at least a hand, on the tiller. The head perhaps knowing that she was the problem, had no desire to prevent her school being amalgamated. The ILEA saw this as a chance to move her on. We weren't surprised to see that she found a school in Bournemouth in which to re-establish her management skills. In the meantime, we were invited to apply for our jobs in the new school in competition with teachers from the three other schools. It was a horrible process, 
in a 20-minute interview in front of a panel of 25 persons, teachers who'd given their working lives to some of the most difficult schools in London, were asked to explain why they should keep their jobs. The results were even worse. A head of art, loved and respected by all after ten years' work at the school, was replaced by his deputy, who had been happily working with him for ages. The man suffered serious depression. Many others did not get their old jobs back. There was considerable anguish and bitterness. Teachers began turning against each other. Cliques began to form. Now we felt the same sort of frustration from which our pupils had been suffering for years. When the new head was appointed, he brought with him a clique from his previous school to fill the senior posts. That sense of common understanding in the staff room vanished overnight. Dalston Mount wasn't a nice place to be at anymore. In fact, Dalston Mount, after only 11 years of life, ceased to be. I was lucky. Although I didn't keep my job as head of history in the new school, I did at least keep a job as a teacher. In any case, I had, long before, planned to undertake one year's exchange teaching in the Caribbean. Now I had a chance to do it, so I set off, by plane, for Kingston, Jamaica, just as the new school, named Kingsland, came into being. London reggae as a song that I love to I had attended a public school when I was a teenager. That school is, as I write, still there. It has been there for 160 years. The school has old boys associations, clubs, sports events and dinners. It has teachers that still, 40 years later, are to be found hanging around the cloisters. It is, in the real sense of the word, an establishment. If I should ever wish to do so, I can revive memories of my time at school. I can reconnect for social or even economic reasons with my chums from yesteryear. The girls at Dolster Mount had none of this. Their school, along with Edith Cavell, South Hackney and Shoreditch schools, had just disappeared into something new and largely unfamiliar called Kingsland. In 1985, I decided to put on a reunion for the teachers and girls of Dolster Mount at a local dance hall. The turnout was fantastic. Some 600 girls and most of the teachers turned up to meet their old friends. The girls, now women in their 20s, came dressed to kill. However, it was not to impress any male who might happen to be there. There were indeed some men in the hall. It was a Wednesday night and the management of the club had failed to put up a sign preventing their usual clientele from attending. About 50 men, hoping to pick up a pretty girl to dance with, were hanging around. As the first 50 or so of the girls arrived, the chests of the men swelled and their shoulders straightened. When the next 100 arrived, only the very macho retained their composure. Soon, there were 300 Dolster Mount girls in the room and the confused men were beating a hasty retreat. For the girls had found their classmates and were reliving the moment when they had locked Mr Watt in the stock cupboard or they had piled the desks up to the ceiling in Mr Baldwin's class. They ended by running around the dance hall yelling out the old song at the tops of their voices. The Dolster Mount girls had found themselves. 